What is up, Astro Geeks? Welcome back to the show, the Ephemeris Podcast. I'm your host, Aphelion, and um, I'm still buzzing about episode four. Um, I've put I've put a lot of thought into it even after making it, and um, I just keep thinking about that ten to the power of thirty two thousand number. Um, reflecting on it, it probably doesn't take a day, honestly, but it will definitely take you like at least a couple of hours. Um, I probably got a little too carried away with the numbers as I mentioned when I concluded the episode, but that is uh, beyond us or kind of behind us, sorry. And uh, today we are talking about quasars, and particularly quasars in the early universe, um, what uh, significance they have um, in terms of, you know, galaxy formation, and obviously before we get to that, we'll get into the basics, Uh, but something important to note is that uh, there's so much research, recent discoveries uh, of quasars that I might actually have to split up the uh, kind of uh, deep dive uh, into quasars, um, kind of split that up into two different parts. So the next episode will most likely be a follow up to what we are discussing today about quasars. Um, and it's going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of uh, the history behind finding it and, you know, some other um, really, really puzzling discoveries. But obviously, first, I do want to go over the basics and some of the more like um important uh stuffs <laughs> i don't know if that's a the correct phrase but yeah some more important things about quasars so without further ado let's uh, get into the introduction to these things so what are quasars um put very simply they are crazy bright agn and by agn i mean active galactic nucleus and by active galactic nucleus i mean centers of galaxies that are significantly brighter than the usual center of a black hole. Now that might bring up a little bit of confusion, so let me clarify. Um, An AGN, which that's how I'm going to refer to it for the rest of the episode because it's a bit long to say active galactic nucleus, right? So basically these things can be distinguished by its accretion material kind of around the black hole. Um, You know, like things like the rate of accretion, Uh, orientation of the accretion disk and the presence of jets which um, are another really really important characteristic about quasars that we will delve into a little bit uh, in just a moment so we are um, we are aware based on the brightness that these quasars uh, give us that they're not from stars either so obviously there might be a confusion when you look at a black hole and see oh it's bright there must be you know stars there that's kind of cleared up when we do look into um kind of probably the spectrum of uh emission and all that um and uh another cool thing is that uh the luminosity of a quasar can be seen in any part of the electromagnetic spectrum like you know x-ray gamma radio all that kind of stuff but uh they are uv strong so they're most most of the emission is in the uv part of the spectrum uh some more characteristics Um, Along with the fact that, you know, what I just mentioned, that they have a huge uh, supermassive black hole in the middle with an accretion disk. Um, Along with that and them having uh, relativistic jets made of radio emissions. Uh, Quasars are very old and um, that's actually something uh, that's actually kind of a central idea of the podcast episode today. And uh, more than a million of these things have been found across the cosmos. Uh, just a little bit of subtypes, just going to throw that, throw them out there, mention them, because obviously, you know, they exist, but um, I don't want to get too deep into the subtypes of quasars, but they're like radio quiet and radio loud uh, quasars, which is basically just determined by the radio emissions that come out of the jets. Um, there's broad absorption line and type 2, and these get more into the spectroscopy of specific quasars and where they kind of fit in. So, we know what a quasar is. How does it work? Because obviously, you know, knowing what it is isn't quite enough here on this podcast. So, how a quasar works is basically accretional matter that is around this black hole. As it falls towards it, releases lots of heat and radiation uh due to the friction uh that kind of occurs um around the black hole 
But obviously, um, when you just think about that intuitively, you, you would think, wait, that doesn't make any sense because nothing escapes a black hole, right? Well, to address that, it happens in the out outskirts of the black hole, this whole process. Otherwise, we obviously can't see it. And what keeps it on the outskirts is uh, basically the angular momentum of the accretion, which is, I guess, just a fancy way of saying, you know, um, the, the movement of the accretional matter kind of just finds really, really uh, funny ways to escape uh, getting sucked into the black hole. So this process that I've just described makes quasars very luminous and therefore if you look into it, you know, okay, this is accretional matter that's around the black hole that's doing something interesting that isn't quite, you know, just stars getting in the way. Um, and so that's one part of the uh, quasar that we've just addressed, but then there's the second part, which is the relativistic jets. And it's a little vague when you look at the explanations of how the relativistic jets work uh, on a typical online search. So I'm just going to try and be as concise and, um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to try to make my explanation as understandable as possible. So jets are created by the strong magnetization of the accretion disk by a spinning black hole. So there's a spinning black hole and accretion matter will be around it. And, um, uh, it just, it just magnetizes and, um, it'll create a jet like flow out, like outward of the black hole. Um, unfortunately we can't really point our finger on what these jets consist of. Like if you, there are multiple different descriptions for what happens with the jets, you know, they'll throw like vocabulary out there, like electron volts, charged particles, ejected gas, ionized matter. But, um, we're still not like, you know completely sure on the processes that happen there and you know exactly um how things kind of work out but if we did it would be very helpful for astrophysical understanding um and um lot a lot more mysteries about quasars would probably be revealed so uh, that's how a quasar works now let's get into why i mentioned that uh quasars being old is really really important the reason why it is, is because it's a big indicator of galaxy evolution. As far as the theory goes, because they are so far away and so old, they give us a glimpse of what a galaxy may have looked like as it was forming. So basically, um, quasars are on the outskirts uh, of our universe, and for the light for the light from them to travel all the way to us takes a really really long time and um there's quite a lot of rest shift that occurs that confirms that you know they're quite far out and um the light that's coming to us is very very old could be from you know the beginnings of the universe so that kind of um that kind of suggests to us that um we might be seeing a galaxy forming um in the early universe through quasars and uh yeah theories suggest that galaxies without jets and big accretion disks could have been quasars in their early life and quasars is just a really early form of gal the galaxies that we see uh, around us now however we are still not sure how a phenomena like this uh was possible in such a short amount of time because some of the uh some of the oldest quasars that we found are like only 700 million years after the big bang happened which is uh astronomically very very short amount of time however there has been research done to explain this and i'm pretty much just gonna summarize some of the uh findings of an article that i found uh from uh, published by uh, space space.com jeez i'm struggling to speak right now so basically in this uh, study that space.com describes um astronomers ran a simulation and found that like star forming gas would amass at the center of two cold gas streams that happened to just uh, be present in the early universe but instead of turning into stars the turbulence in the gas from these streams created a gravitational collapse uh and became a black hole so um I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We we understand that black holes um, occur due to the gravitational collapse of uh, an old or dying star. 
And so this kind of simulated um, occurrence uh, was a feasible origin for origin for quasars for the astronomers. And it's possible that uh, it's also possible that two of these black holes merged and created uh, gravitational waves, which is kind of, you know, just a little bit more nitty gritty details. But I think one of the most important things that came out of this uh, research that was described is that it could be a turning point in understanding the primordi uh, primordial universe. Yeah, I'm saying that correctly. Uh, because uh, previously it was believed that stars back then could only form in extreme environments, but you know, two cold gas streams coming together and causing gravitational collapse isn't quite extreme for... Um, stuff that happened in the universe back then that we theorize happened. So other than that, uh, other than figuring out how quasars were found or were uh, created in the early universe, there have been some other discoveries. Like it's possible that they could be a new standard candle. Um, I'm not completely sure how to describe what a standard candle is. It, it's basically the purpose of such objects. Um, is to just like act as like cosmic markers like oh um they're um the, the 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 objects that are standard candles tend to have like a uniform like what do you call it burn through rate and um you can just you can use the characteristics of the object to um just determine where everything is that's basically what i know about standard candles i always have a hard time explaining what that is but i'm sure uh, quick search might help your understanding on what uh, standard candles are. Uh, but yeah, um, the quasars could be new standard candles because uh, some research has found out that when its UV radiation interacts with high energy electrons, it changes to uh, X-ray radiation, and this transfer they determined has like a fixed proportionality, and that could be really really helpful because. Uh, that's quite similar to um, how um, we use uh, Type 1a supernovas as standard candles. Uh, the theory holds up for the most part. Uh, further research found that like uh, quasars' burn-through rate is uniform, but um, there's a big caveat to this. It's that like our accuracy in locating a quasar is much, much less than uh, supernovas. So that was a little bit of doubt put into there. Um, but yeah, uh, additionally, there are theories about supposedly vanishing, uh, black holes and quasars and how they contribute to detecting dark matter and an interesting history into, uh, how they were, uh, discovered. Um, but that's for next episode, as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and, uh, that's all I have for this part of quasars episode five. Uh, we're on a roll. I kind of like where this is going. I'm putting a lot of uh, effort into getting the research done. Uh, maybe a couple of, you know, holes and patches I can uh, improve on here and there. But I hope you're enjoying the information you're getting. I really enjoy looking into all of these things and kind of simplifying things, but also really, you know, uh, clearing up uh, a lot of the possible, you know, like uh, unknowns and misunderstandings of... Uh, parts of the cosmos. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. If you have, follow me on Spotify. Um, I've recently created a new YouTube channel for this podcast. So if you're listening from uh, YouTube, hi. Um, we'd love to see you uh, on the Spotify as well if you'd uh, like to check that out. And um, for the Spotify users, there is a YouTube channel. So yeah, just putting that out there. Um, anyways, that is all that I've got for you guys today. And I will see you in the next episode for part two of Quasars. Peace.